Wonderful. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Capata and Dr. Nelson, for the uh, opportunity to speak. Um, I assume to a whole host of mesh enthusiasts on the Saturday afternoon. So I'll be talking about uh, absorbable synthetic mesh, and uh, I'm not an oracle, so I don't have this uh, answer. I'll just tell you right now. Um, I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. We'll leave it up for the customary seven seconds. Um, so. As far as objectives go, I think, uh, at least for me as I was putting this together, I thought it was important to understand the timeline of mesh, and we've heard a lot about uh, the various synthetics and biologics and comparing them, but um, there's, I think that context will help understand why we have these absorbable meshes. Um, as a surgeon, I think it's paramount that if you're going to be putting in meshes, it's important to know at least some of the basic properties, and maybe not every nitty-gritty detail, but um, you know, depending on what's available at your institution, I think it's worth the deep dive um, as you're putting these in. Um, we'll certainly review some of the outcomes that we have. And then I, th I think the ultimate goal is to decide how and where this might fit in your practice. So as far as timeline, um, you know, the original meshes uh, are, are back in the 40s and eventually in the 60s. They started with nylon by two French surgeons, uh, Aqua Biba and Bure. Um, polypropylene was actually introduced back in 1962, and as we just heard, it's pretty much going strong at this point. Um, we've added polyester, PTFE, um, and then biologics came about in the 90s um, with this big expansion in the late 2000s with things like Stratus. Um, in the kind of intermediary, you have composite meshes, coated meshes, all these kind of devices um, to serve the cause of, you know, repairing our hernias, giving us durability. But I think the, the rise of this biosynthetic group is really the, the issue of contamination. Um, in the late 2000s, you saw this rapid you know, pickup of biologic meshes, and uh, the promise was they were going to fix this issue of having infectious complications. But as we just heard from Dr. Perez, that's clearly not borne born out in the data. Um, and now you see this uh, pendulum swinging back towards uh, more synthetic options. Obviously, there's still no perfect option, and that's why we're now talking about uh, synthetic biomaterials. Um, and this is a very cursory review. I think if you're going to look at what you're going to put in, this is the stuff that I would be interested in as a surgeon um, for each particular product. Um, whether it's woven and knitted like we're used to with our polypropylene meshes or whether it's a scaffold material, does it have pores? Um, is it monofilament versus multifilament? We know from synthetic materials that are multifilament, the bacteria can kind of get entrapped in those fibers and it becomes harder to clear an infection. Um, absorption, I think, is the next kind of big category of, uh, you know, data or, uh, you know, characteristics of the mesh. Um, rapidly absorbable meshes here, I think, of Vicryl or Polyglactin um, that has, like, a absorption time of about 70 days or under three months. Um, and then the more slowly absorbable products, which I think are more appropriate for uh, anterior fascial uh, reinforcement, which can last up to three years. And then we have some combination products that put together uh, fast and slow uh, absorption fibers. Um, and then, you know, is, are, is it coated? Can I put this in the abdominal cavity if, I, if I'm aiming for that? Um, or, and we, this hasn't been done yet, but eventually I imagine someone's going to start coating these in antibiotics or, or some form. So as you look at your product, I think these are the kind of critical categories to understand as you're putting them in. Um, so the big players, again, these are all trademarked just for specificity. Um, Gorbio A, that's uh, polyglycolic acid and uh, trimethylene carbonate. It's a 3D scaffold, so it doesn't have the pores that um, you're kind of used to seeing in terms of polypropylene mesh, but uh, some of you may have experience uh, placing this near the hiatus for foregut repairs. Um, this is absorbed in about six to seven months, and unfortunately, aside from the, you know, chemical absorption, which, uh, and these time frames are quite variable, uh, there's a question of how long does the strength last as it's getting absorbed. And for gore, we really don't know that, but obviously it's not going to be much more than six to seven months. Um, Novus Tiger Matrix, this is uh, an interesting uh, mesh where it's two different polymers, the glycolide lactide, uh, trimethylene carbonate, and then a lactide. And it's a multifilament, so kind of like our old polyester meshes. And this has a uh, fast absorbing fiber and a slow absorbing fiber. And the fast one goes away uh, just kind of a little bit longer than Vicryl would. Um, and then the slower one lasts up to three years. Interestingly, the strength uh, of these tends to last about two weeks and then six months. And then in this, in their own provided graph here, you see it starts off quite rigid, becomes elastic, and then eventually goes away. Um, as far as phasics, uh, I think this is 
one of the more common ones that we, we see used now uh, for uh, certain scenarios. Um, it's a polyhydroxy for, or poly four hydroxy butyrate. It's made by E. coli and they kind of uh, weave it in a monofilament uh, fiber. So it, it tends to look very much like uh, polypropylene, which we're kind of used to. Um, it goes away in about a year to year and a half. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about whether that's true or not. Uh, it loses almost a third of its strength at about three months. So even though it's lasting for a year and a half, um, it, that absorption profile is, is different than the actual strength profile. So how do they compare? And this is kind of the hypothetical uh, aspects. Like what are we trying to accomplish with these? Well, it's a non-permanent foreign body. It's still a foreign body. We just heard from the, the last session how people are pulling phasics out well after the, the year and a half mark. Um, I certainly have a patient who I'm doing that for soon. Um, so it's still a foreign body. It still has to ingrow. It still needs foreign body reaction. It's just eventually we assume that they'll completely go away. Um, some mimic the favorable characteristics of macroporous synthetics, which we just heard do really well in clean uh, fields and even in some contaminated fields. And then, again, are these resistant to infection? Much like the biologics uh, in the late 2000s, we assume that there's this significant benefit here. Now, what are the drawbacks? Well, they're significantly more expensive than a, a cheap $200 sheet of polypropylene. Um, we don't know the long-term durability, but we'll discuss that uh, coming up here. And then I, I put resistance to infection in the drawbacks as well because this is, it mirrors kind of what happened with the biologics where we assume that it's great and we start using it and then we look back and we say, oh, that wasn't as good as we thought. Um, so let's look at some actual data and, uh, you know, without turning this into a journal club. Uh, this was a study about BioA, uh, a long-term um, uh, study from a single center. It was a retrospective review of a fairly small 49 patients. Um, they use BioA in clean fields, uh, and they put this in the sublay space doing open retrorectus uh, with TAR. Uh, when you read the paper, it's unclear how many patients really got TAR, um, but ultimately it was placed in the sublay space. And we, they reported a 4% SSI rate with no mesh explantation. Um, they quoted a 4.6% uh, uh, recurrence rate at two years, but interestingly, they studied these folks out uh, really nicely to five years, and they showed that that rate pretty much triples uh, five years out into 14, which is still, you know, a reasonable number. Um, but as their Kaplan-Meier uh, estimator, you know, the graph shows, at six years, they expected that to rise to 18. So when you see these hard numbers of 4.6 at two, I think it's not the full picture, and it, you really should read the papers related to the mesh that you're thinking about putting in and make sure it's, you know, as you're quoting, you know, a 4.5% recurrence rate at two years, I think it's worthwhile to mention that over five years, that's really kind of taking a, a curve for the bad. Um, what about BioA uh, placed in clean contaminated fields where you're, you're kind of really testing out that, you know, resistance to infection claim? Well, this is a nice multi-center prospective trial. They uh, did an intention entry analysis of 104 patients, um, about a, a quarter of them were clean contaminated, uh, or clean contaminated, and then uh, three quarters were contaminated. Again, placed vast majority as a sublay in the retrorectus space, um, a handful of intraperitoneal underlays. Uh, a lot of these folks got component separation, the vast majority uh, getting posteriors. So they showed an 18% uh, SSI rate, which you can see a pretty big jump from the four in the last study, uh, and a 17% recurrence rate at two years, again, up quite a bit at the two-year mark uh, compared to the, the last study. Now, interestingly, again, without getting into every little detail of this paper, um, I think where you put the mesh matters. Uh, when they an analyze whether it was placed as a sublay or an underlay, you can see it's 13% recurrence versus 40. So where these meshes go matters just as much as, you know, what, what product you're using. Um, there's not too much about Tiger, unfortunately. Uh, this was just a single surgeon series. Uh, they did it as a kind of CQI implementation, so it's got its selection bias. Uh, issues. Um, they analyzed 91 of their patients. It was a, a pretty heterogeneous uh, mix of fields, everything from clean to uh, fully dirty, you know, mesh infection, uh, wound infection cases. So, um, and their technique changed as well. They were doing anterior components, they went to endoscopic, and then eventually went to TAR as the study progressed. Um, they reported an overall 10% SSI. Again, hard to interpret really with the, the mix of cases, the mix of techniques. Um, but they had a 12% recurrence rate at a mean follow-up of 42 months, but only about two-thirds of those patients were followed up for uh, three years. 
Um, they, again, kind of looked at their own data, uh, and in the paper they say, well, we weren't happy with our outcome, so we looked at uh, changing the technique to TAR, and when they did that, those folks had a, a significantly improved recurrence rate and SSI rate down in the kind of 5% range. Um, Phasix, that's probably the product that uh, I, I, I see a lot um, being used. Uh, it, this was a nice uh, multi-center prospective trial. Again, 121 patients. Um, they used them in clean fields. Similar to the previous studies, we're placing a lot of these in the sublay space uh, with a re release. Um, about a quarter did get onlays. Um, so 10% SSI rate in clean fields. That was kind of, I thought that was interesting. Um, and then an 18% recurrence rate at three years. So similar to that kind of Gore Bio A uh, number, although that was uh, a little farther out. Um, but again, mirroring some of the, the trends that you're seeing, where you put it matters. Uh, the onlay space has associated with nearly a 30% recurrence rate, whereas the sublay space is down in the 12 range. So, um, you know, again, where you put it matters. Uh, maybe for those of you who are doing more laparoscopic uh, IPOM type repairs or whether that's robotically, um, this is an, a prospective trial um, for Phasix ST, so a coded Phasix for intraperitoneal use. Uh, used in clean fields, um, all MIS approaches. They all did fascial closure, um, about 50-50, you know, at least fairly close as far as lap first robot. They reported no SSIs, which I thought was impressive, um, just one hematoma. And this, I think, is pretty telling. 31%, uh, 32% uh, recurrence rate at 24 months. I mean, that's one in three folks that are coming back. Um, a lot of these actually did require reoperations. Um, and then when they broke down what you know, subgroup-wise, uh, bigger defects where I think we understand that if you have a big seven-centimeter defect that even if you get fascial closure, just patching it um, from above or below is probably not going to lead to a really desirable outcome, and that's kind of borne out in this uh, study. Um, under seven, you know, it's one in five. It's not horrible, but um, I, I don't think I'd be particularly thrilled about that either. So we got all this data, what's, what's my take home points? I, I think the, the question I ask myself all the time uh, when dealing with these cases is what's my goal? What's the patient's goal? Um, is this a life-saving operation? Are you using a biologic or biosynthetic just to get out of Dodge? Are you doing a definitive repair? Um, I think if you're aiming for the definitive repair, there's so much good data saying, uh, you know, just a cheap macroporous polypropylene is just a, a durable, safe option that it's hard to recommend using this very costly, uh, you know, uh, mesh to, you know, obviate that. Um, what about patient expectations and goals? Uh, you know, if someone comes in, maybe they've had a bad experience, it's a recurrent hernia, they don't want mesh in, you know that you're not going to have a great outcome with a primary repair. I think this is, uh, this is a point of use for maybe even a clean case uh, or a purely, purely elective case where you say, listen, I, I don't want to just do sutures, but at least let's put some uh, you know, absorbable mesh in there, and long term this may recur. But being honest, having that communication, I think it's incredibly important. Um, as far as recurrence rates, I think operative technique, as as we just kind of went over, really matters. Um, I am I'm I don't do a lot of onlay or underlay type repairs uh, unless it's you know it, it might be. Uh, a desirable outcome for someone who's 85 and you're just looking for a quick, easy fix. Um, but if I'm going for durability, I think uh, whether you're using uh, you know, permanent or absorbable mesh, the sublay space is, is still our best friend here. Um, and then it increases with time. We, we see this early two-year data and it, it seems reassuring. We pat ourselves on the back saying, hey, only five out of 100 patients are coming back with recurrences. But as we follow them out, and which I don't think we tend to do, at least reliably in the hernia world where, you know, five years out, they might have a recurrence. They just haven't called you. We're not calling them and following them annually with CT scans. So um, I think this number probably is even higher than we know. Um, Wound complications, again, these certainly are not immune to infection. These aren't drastically different SSI numbers than we see for polypropylene or biologics. Um, but the nice thing is that it's non-permanent. So for folks that may have had you know, chronic draining wounds or something like that, you can 
at least reassure them that, hey, theoretically this is gonna go away, we're not leaving something permanent. Um, whether that's your comfort or the patient's comfort, I think that, uh, that, that can give you an option there. So is this the future? Uh, unfortunately, like I said at the beginning of the talk, I'm not an oracle, I do not know. Um, I think the questions that really remain are durability. What's this gonna look like in 10 years? Um, are all these folks just gonna come back in with uh, you know, an interesting looking collagen scar plate, put a hernia through it no matter what? Um, what about things like reoperation? If you cut through someone who's had phasics 10 years ago or bio A 10 years ago, is that gonna um, you know, pretty much just function like a uh, recurrent hernia, like it was a primary closure, whereas at least with polypropylene, you can close that with a proline on your way out. So I think these are the questions that uh, you know, the future literature is gonna answer, and I, I think at least for me, this is what I want to see uh, kind of borne out before I make uh, any hard decisions. Thank you.